enjoyed the networking break and managed to connect with some interesting people. I'm pleased to welcome our next set of panelists to the stage. This panel will explore how material companies and brands can successfully work together, and it's moderated by Lauren Sherman. Lauren is the chief correspondent at the Business of Fashion. She began her reporting career at Forbes and has also contributed to the New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, New Yorker, New York Mag, among others. Our panelists are Andy Bass, Chief Marketing Officer at Forager, Brittany Burns, Director of Strategy and Corporate Development at Fashion for Good, Engvar Hengelson, CEO and co-founder of Vitro Labs, and Allison Melville, GM of Product Innovation at Reformation. Um, welcome all to the stage, and we will have some time for questions at the end, so please put your questions in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you all for being here. I have a little bit of a cold, first one in many years, so I apologize in advance, but I'm really excited to do this panel because obviously these partnerships are how this the product that you all are making or some of you are making get out, and we have people from the the developer side from the brand side and from the sort of industry side to to talk about each angle so i thought a really good way to start would be to kind of get give the audience a sense i'm sure the audience is very familiar with all of you but as a sense of the service you offer or or the service you're seeking so Brittany, maybe let's start with you and then we can go through the group what what brings you to this conversation mater about materials in particular. Cool. All right. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm Brittany. I'm the director of strategy at Fashion for Good um, in uh, kind of a very short statement. So we're a global innovation platform. We pull together innovators and in industry to help scale their pioneering solutions. So this could be anything from raw materials to, you know, dyeing or dye machines, circular business model tech, all the way through to recycling, whether it's mechanical or chemical. Uh, we play a few different roles, so from financing to driving what we call consortium-style projects to pull the relevant stakeholders together. Um, but what we really do is pride ourselves on kind of putting our heads down and doing the tough work required to actually get some of these things scaled and things moving. Um, I'll leave it at that because I think this panel is actually a really good representation of our work. We've been working with the Ecovative team since 2018, and we're lucky to count Reformation as uh, one of our industry partners. So um, I'll let the other, uh, my other colleagues say a few things. Lots of synergies. Allison, sure. how about how about you next? Yeah. Hi. Nice to see all of you. Um, so I'm Allison, the GM of Product Innovation at Reformation. If you're not familiar with Reformation, I hope you are. But um, we are a sustainable fashion brand. Uh, we operate globally. We have over 30 stores. So, you know, our, our space in this conversation really is that we are a B2C. So we go directly to the customer designing and manufacturing um, products. And what we're really interested in our role in this conversation is how do we commercialize these? How do we how do we take technology and convert it into a product that is really covetable for our consumer? So really excited to be part of the conversation. And and Ingvar, how about you? You're you're making some of the products that companies like Reformation might want to use. So can you talk a bit more about what you all do and and your role in this conversation? Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me here. And uh, so my name is uh, Ingvar, co-founder and CEO of uh, Vitro Labs. So at uh, Vitro Labs, we are pioneering a cutting edge way to grow real animal hides using advanced tissue engineering processes uh, that start only with a few animal cells. So the kind of the equivalent of cell 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 based meats, but for the for the for the leather industry. Um, so after the growth process is complete, our hides are then harvested and transformed into cultivated leather through tanning. Um, the progress that we've made is that we're going now from R&D to pilot manufacturing. And uh, in parallel, we've, of course, working, we've been working closely with a um, tannery in France uh, to develop an optimal tanning and finishing recipe that uh, allows our hides to achieve, of course, the durability uh, and other premium qualities of traditional leather. Um, this Long-term partnership is 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 you kind know, of is big big part of uh, our recent progress and success, and uh, it's what brings me to this panel. Great, and looking forward to hearing more about that, Andy. What about you? 
Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Bass. I'm the chief marketing officer at Forger, uh, a division of Ecovative. And Ecovative, you probably know best as the mycelium material uh, company that uh, commercialized mushroom packaging. So this is a home compostable alternative to styrofoam. Um, at Forager, the key thing we do, though, is use mycelium to produce um, hides and foams. Um, and then we do this without using any animals or any plastics. Um, so to produce these materials, we rely on kind of the natural ability of mycelial fibers to grow into a structural matrix. And our expertise lies in, in tuning that growth in order to make products with specific performance attributes. So ultimately, earth-friendly materials that perform like leathers, technical insulations, uh, and elastomeric foams. So we have a little bit of everything here. So I, I think to start, there are many ways that suppliers and brands can partner. Uh, uh, tons of different examples. Ingvar, it might be good to start with you actually, because you all just raised a lot of money and you raised it from the caring par partially from the caring group, which is a big producer of luxury goods. The story was actually, I think BOF had the exclusive on it, our cor chief course, um, sustainability correspondent, Sarah Kent, covered it. It's really interesting because that's an example of, you know, not, not saying we're making this amount of product for a brand to sell in their store, but more about this huge company is taking a, a big bet on, on what you all are doing at Vitro Labs. So could you talk a bit more about that and other ways in which you've partnered with brands? Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, we like to, as, as you might see in our kind of communication history, we like to keep partnerships and, and kind of communication under wraps until there is something to reveal about the outcome of it. Uh, since our Series A announcement earlier this month, we can, of course, now talk about the uh, technical partnership with, with Caring that, we, that we've had uh, on, on tanning specifically. And it's really a great example of how we, uh, how we partner with companies. So there are really kind of three pillars of alignment for us uh, when, it come, when it comes to partnerships. So first of all, we align with companies on the mission first. And, um, and I think caring mission statement, uh, which I quote here, offer a stimulating caring environment where creativity, audacity, and diversity fuel the success of our houses and drive our vision of sustainable and influential luxury. So this is a quote from, from caring on, on their mission statement. And uh, we couldn't really be better aligned on, the, on, kind of on our vision of how, the future, of how the future should work. Then um, it's also on strategy. So again, kind of we are committed to drive transformation, uh, transformative innovation uh, in the leather supply chain. And Caring is really putting the means of action towards the research of the best solution in that specific um, area. And so we're using new technologies to re reinvent the supply chain itself uh, in a meaningful way. Now, of course, it takes time and uh, a lot of effort and dedication. So it's absolutely no you know, short-term play. But then also it's, it's the alignment of a shared point of view. So again, you know, delighting the customer is really the end goal. Um, and I see Alison is, is agreeing there because again, with, with the, with, without the customer's approval of what we're doing, then you know, everything would be for, for, for nothing. So all of our decisions are based on what is best for the customer uh, and which is to make sure that the brands that we partner with have the absolute best selection of the finest leathers available uh, to them and in turn to their customers. So we want to make sure that we're staying away from a pure marketing play and, and pure kind of uh, making sure that our partnerships are turn into real transformative change for the consumer. Uh, and in this case, our, our, the luxury consumer. And uh, as I mentioned, yeah, it's not a short term play uh, when you're trying to kind of completely restructure a supply chain, but, but it's, that's really how we see the partnerships and but it all comes down to the customer at the end. Alison, what about you as a independent firm that is is has always put sort of sustainability and all these advancements and progressive ways of working first? How do you how have you partnered with material suppliers? What are some examples of things you've done? Have has anything gone to market? Yeah, absolutely. So we really think about it as um, 
you know, a portfolio of partnerships, right? Like there's not one silver bullet that we have a variety of product types. Um, but, you know, we, we really think about how can we approach this from a variety of angles? Um, but one example is um, we are one of the, I don't, I think this might be the public announcement of it or the press release is is just going out shortly. Um, but we've been working four months with Ecovative um, to be one of part of their forager collaborative. So we are working um, with them. I hear we have something uh, coming our way um, so that we can test with. But basically, you know, it's agreed with Ingvar. It's a long term commitment, right? These things are not going to change overnight. And fashion brands, we tend to move fast, right? We have, especially brands like ours, where we turn products so quickly, you know, we can prototype really quickly, but we also, on the flip side, need to be patient because the material develops this more slowly than we can develop product. So we need to kind of reset our expectations, understand that these are long-term plays and then re react fast when, when, um, when we're ready to go. Andy, can you talk a bit about what the Reformation partnership, how that came about from your side and some other examples of, of partnerships that Ecovative are working on? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the Reformation uh, partnership came about through Fashion for Good. So a perfect example Amazing. of like this panel <laughs> working together. Um, so so we, we just announced that yesterday. Um, so Reformation joins uh, uh, bestseller PVH, Vivo Barefoot, and Pangaea in this uh, Forager Fashion for Good uh, cooperative. Um, we also announced um, news of direct partnership with Wolverine Worldwide, which uh, mm -hmm. if you guys heard earlier uh, with Gavin and Barry, that conversation. Um, so, so in each of these partnerships, we're providing mycelium materials initially for brands to test. Um, we get feedback. Our scientists then go in and kind of optimize strains and growth conditions to meet those necessary performance markers uh, for whatever the application uh, is. Um, so we span everything from leather-like materials um, to foams to structural support components. And we look to, you know, our partners are experts in these in, in their categories. Um, so they know what uh, their customers expect from their products, whether it's handbags or footwear. And to us, these partnerships represent, uh, they're, they're, the partnerships with brands um, are really essential to how we develop and advance new materials that consumers are ultimately going to love. Brittany, you, I assume, have a lot of insight from both sides because you're working with everyone on, to make these things happen. A, why are partnerships like this important, especially if they're not about like scaling at market yet? And B, what, how do you measure success? in in a partnership between a, a provider and a brand yeah so i think there's one of the main reasons why we love kind of the special sauce if you will is to be able to pull together an innovator and multiple of our industry partners because a for the innovator it saves them time so instead of having all these individual conversations doing all these different tests with all these different partners we can pull that together and, and as an entrepreneur right time is your most scarce resource um, and then from the brand side of things it actually allows a de-risking element. So, you know, they're again, not going totally out on, on a limb, taking a chance on someone when it's multiple folks together, there's that de-risking element. Um, I think when you look at, you know, further proof points or kind of what comes out of this, you can look at some of the work that um, some of our other innovators have done in different spaces. So for example, we have one called Natural Fiber Welding. They've been doing a lot. Um, they have a partnership with Patagonia. They also have a partnership with BMW. It, you know, it's not limited to the fashion industry, those that use, you know, kind of leather alternative materials. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we can say that term these days, but, um, and then, you know, we have one that uh, innovator called Spinova that did a jacket with Adidas. But what's really exciting for us to see with that is they're building on that. So it starts as one product, but then they keep going, you know, there's a starting point, but then there's a commitment to that long lasting partnership to co-develop together. Um, you know, it's been said on this panel already, it takes time for this stuff. Um, and then I think maybe the last kind of proof point that goes to this, this conversation is um, we have another innovator called um, Infinitive Fiber Company or IFC, uh, kind of a cotton alternative play. And they're working with our partners at PVH, Pangaea and Bestseller to sign offtake agreements um, or commitments. And that's that, that sweet unlock that helps them, you know, in turn secure capital and, you know, shows, shows the demand is there. 
Um, and then also last week, they announced a really exciting $100 million offtake deal with Inditex. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, there was a lot of talk and there's now a lot more action, um, which is really, really exciting. And it's showing that the industry is committed to moving beyond pilots or tests and capsule collections into really long-term commercially viable commitments. Allison, how do you think about this as, as a firm that, it, how are you baking this into your business plan every year? And what are your expectations for these partnerships? Do you want to be able to achieve scale with these materials in a certain number of years? Are you thinking one by one? Is it, I know it's, it doesn't sound like anyone's going to say it's a pure marketing play, but it does have some marketing value. Like what, what do you see as the measurements of how do you convince your CEO that this is worth the money to invest in? Yeah, I think Reformation might be a unique, one of the unique brands in this space where we were founded on sustainability. We actually don't see this as a marketing play at all. In fact, we do a lot under the hood that we don't even talk about. Um, so to us, this is just the normal course of business. And I actually am in the lucky position of not having to make a business case to the CEO um, because this is our mission, which is to you know be part of the Reformation, reform the fashion industry, move it forward. And this is the kind of work you have to do to do that. Um, yeah, ultimately, of course, all of these partnerships, the goal is scale. But I will say the goal is not just scale for us. The goal is actually to bring these materials to market so that other people use them, right? Like we we want we want the future of materials and material innovation to be the norm across the industry, not just exclusive to us. But if we can play a pivotal role in getting them off the ground, that's great. Um, to your question about timeline, I think at least from my perspective, sometimes it's really hard to pinpoint actual launch dates, market viability, you know, sure there's a material ready date, but then we as the brand have to go through a series of prototyping, understand how to work with the material. And that takes time too. And sometimes those, those timelines are a bit indiscernible at the outset, because we really are talking about like innovative technology here. Um, so I think the name of the game is being flexible around what product, uh, what, what your product launch timeline is and just you know, being a little bit responsive to the conditions um, of the partnership. Ingvar, how do you all measure success from your side? And what does it take? Like, what is a, what is an ideal partner on the brand side for you? What do, what do they need to be open about and, and be willing to collaborate on to make it work? It comes down to kind of the mission again, and the, and the, and the value alignment in the beginning, because again, if 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 the partners aren't aligned on those core um, on those core beliefs, then of course it will never lead to a successful partnership. Um, so, but after kind of after one finds a partner that that is aligned on that, then it's really around the initial stages of discussion and project scoping. Um, it's very important to be aligned on what that means and kind of what the deliverables are. Um, and then you know, what we've seen has been very successful for us is regular check-ins, um, making sure that the we're tracking kind of the short-term projects versus uh, long-term goals. Um, and again, making sure that there is constant alignment. There is uh, also on innovative materials like, like ours, it's demonstrating regular progress and uh, kind of because companies are starting to work with you know larger you know, brands are starting to work with companies like ours at the earlier stage so for them to understand that you know progress hasn't stalled in development but development takes time is important um and um, so it's really kind of building that trust for us also you kind know, of one of our i don't know if i should kind of uh, tout that here, but uh, um, might be shooting myself in the foot. But uh, one of our kind of uh, secrets has also also been the team. Um, for example, I mean, our chief product officer, uh, Francois. So he was uh, for almost eight years at uh, Chanel and where he was um, working in their kind of sourcing department for, for leathers. Uh, and so it's really having people in the team that can kind of bridge that gap between our engineers and scientists who are kind of really doing the doing a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the development of the material but it is also rare to find engineers and scientists that have that 
deep knowledge of of an industry so uh, of the industry that we're in so so you know having um Francois on the team that can really translate what the customers are saying to actionable improvements um on the on the engineering and the science side uh, that's that's really been you know a huge part of our success here Andy, do you want to piggyback on that? I'm sure that you have similar insights to Ingvar, but maybe some additional points. Yeah, I think Ingvar made an excellent point too, that our, our industry is so new that having people that that are, are experts across multiple domains like really helps us figure out the path forward. And I think some of the key things we're looking at, uh, at to make our partnership successful are really like understanding the partner supply chain like rather than exist separately, we want to we want to actually be part of the stack. Um, so how do we best integrate into an existing process without making it, um, you know, to, presenting too many hurdles to get to market? Um, I think obviously knowing product specifications uh, that we're trying to hit. So you know what qualities or performance metrics are we do, do we need from a material? And I think another. Um, uh, another aspect is just like understanding all the idiosyncrasies of like a project or the supply chain evolved, like uh, involved. Um, th there's so many little things that might trip you up along the way. So trying to understand those things uh, as early as possible. Um, and then, and then of course, like having visibility to like, okay, how's the material going to be used downstream? What's its purpose? Um, I think leather tanneries are a perfect example of this, where we're offering, you know, a, a new material to a process process that's been around for like hundreds of years. Uh, and then it goes into another process that turns the leather into a product. So um, yeah, ha having as much visibility into all of that uh, is, is, uh, is really helpful for us. And in, in past projects, like we've been successful at scaling mycelium materials in other industries, like packaging, we're doing this in food now. Um, so like, again, like looking at how do we fit into a process that exists? Where can we offer improvements or reduce steps? Um, and I think you know we're excited to do this in the fashion space, where uh, you know it's going to have a tremendous impact in just making the industry overall more more sustainable once we get to scale. Allison, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to. I, I think you know Andy's articulation of the the um, supplier's understanding of the product is important, but I also just want to say that the brand's understanding of what the material limitations are is also important so that it can be an iterative design product process, right? So where it's not just a situation where material suppliers are trying to exactly comp leather as it exists today, but rather that we work together to figure out how to work with this new material, understand that we might have to change things about how we process or manufacture um, so that it's, it's a truly a two-way understanding. It's a really good point, and I'm curious to know what are some of the other things, Allison, from your perspective, and then Andy and Ingvar from your perspective, and then Brittany. I ha I I will pull you into this because I think you have you have the big picture. But um, what are some of the other kind of qualities that you're looking for, Allison, in a partner in this space? Like what other also, you know, you need to understand the limitations that you clearly do. But what what are you looking for when you when you find find these partners? Is it is it you know proof of concept? Is it the the kinds of people who are backing them already? What what is it that makes you say okay, this is worth taking the risk here? Yeah, I think it. I think it's a lot of what's what you just mentioned. Then what's already been said, which is, um, you know, proof of concept is always great, even if it's not the exact material we're working on. Just uh, demonstrate a team of folks that's brought something to market successfully. To me, means it's. Um, and I don't mean this to cast dispersion on a scientist, it's, but it's not just a group of scientists, it's a group of scientists that's working on a commercial application of a technology. Um, so really seeing seeing that foundation in the team, super important. And then also um, some demonstration of the scale, of the potential scale of the, of the material. Um, so really those are kind of the two most important factors, but then there's a lot of elements of partnership along the way that have already been said, which is communication and an aesthetic understanding, a real interest in how we're going to be using the product. All of those are really critical to the execution of the partnership. Ingvar, on your side, I, I assume patience and understanding that this is a process is a main, a big, 
a big element of this, a big quality that you're looking for, but are there other things, are you looking for big businesses? Do you work with kind of a, a range of, in terms of annual revenue sized businesses? Like what are you looking for in a brand partner? So from that perspective, of course, it has to kind of connect to revenue and, and future growth, uh, potential future growth as a, as, a, as, a, as a partnership, because again, kind of we, when we enter into a partnership, there's a lot of work that we're putting into it, but there's also a lot of work that the partner is putting into it. So we want to make sure that there can be a you know, growth curve for both parties that, that this will become a kind of relevant, uh, relevant project and a meaningful project uh, on both sides. Um, but, um, but it's really kind of, yeah, picking, picking those partners that are in it for the long haul. And so again, kind of, it can be, it can be a large brand like the caring group, but it can also be smaller brands that, that we are seeing that are really committing to it. Um, so I mean, I think, you know, Reformation is a great example of this being a brand that was founded with those kind of sustainability principles. Um, and, um, and so those are kind of companies that we, that we, love talking to and uh, and and hopefully can work with um going forward of course we're just in the process of of, of scaling up and uh, we have kind of limited bandwidth but uh, but it's really kind of yeah, finding those partners that are willing to invest in the partnership um and again i'm just kind of rehashing what i said earlier but like uh, sh sharing our mission and, uh, and and sharing the vision of what the future should look like um it's building that trust um that uh, and and that trust kind of comes just from from very honest communication back and forth. Um, but then also like we've seen that brands, they don't want to overstretch themselves uh, because again, kind of there are so many solutions out there. So of course, you kind know, of because it's a, it's a much of an investment from time and, and, and financial from the brands themselves to develop product and to test things out. So, so again, kind of, uh, yeah, find, finding, finding those partners that share those values. Andy, what about you? Yeah, so so um, I, I've worked now in the biotech industry for more than 20 years and at this interface of like biotech in the consumer market for, for more than a decade now. And I think the biggest evolution that I've seen in terms of like expectations from brands as well as consumers is yeah, the need to deliver on, on the promise of these new materials at scale. Um, th there was a quote in Neo Life uh, a few years ago now, I think it was, but it, it alluded to like this perpetual fashion show of prototypes. And it was, it was a criticism of like just the overhyping of technologies and products. And I think, you know, people want products they can hold in their hands and, and tangibly show their beliefs about sustainability that's like manifested into a handbag or a shoe from their favorite brand. So there's a lot of cool tech out there, a lot of possibilities for the future, but if, if it can't reach the consumer because it can't be scaled or it's too expensive, like consumers are going to lose interest pretty quick. Um, so, so I guess like to wrap up, like my point is like uh, the expectations from the industry are, uh, you know, deliver a material within a reasonable time frame at a reasonable cost. And that is at a scale that can make a true impact for the brand, for the consumer and ultimately nature, right? Yeah. So Brittany, at, at Fashion for Good, this is obviously only one thing that you're working on. And I'm curious to know broadly in the industry, how has the interest in, in different types of materials changed? Is there increased interest, interest every year? Is there any sort of reticence because there hasn't been a lot of scaling to market? And how are you seeing brands? Are there is there a wider breadth of brands who are interested in these things and looking for the right partners, et cetera? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that point to the material space as being, um, if you ask us, it's always been super interesting and important. I think it's become even more so probably in the past three years. Um, it's also the area where you can have from an environmental perspective, the biggest impact. Um, and there's been a lot of studies done on that and reports released and whatnot. Um, if you look at our portfolio of 158 startups, I want to say probably close to 55% are in the raw materials and processing space. Um, so we really think that that is a massive unlock to, to not just find the best solutions to scale them, but also to have the biggest environmental impact. Um, I think also when you look at kind of what the industry is doing or where they're leaning, um, 
it's raw materials has always been an important component, um, even more so in recent years, but then also because the development timelines for this stuff takes a long time, right? It's, you know, if you look at a brand's development cycle, maybe it's three years they're looking at, but when you're looking at innovation, sometimes it's a 10 year time frame. Um, so a lot of what we do is kind of level set the expectations between the two, much like what was just said of, of really saying like, hey, let's ground this in some reality and figure out how we actually move and like work together on this. So I think from a brand perspective, we've seen the most success with our partners that are super clear about their goals for the new materials. You know, this is what I'm trying to get out of it. And also identifying where they can provide expertise. Um, and then I think from the innovator side, it's figuring out, you know, being really transparent and honest, even though sometimes it feels painful and maybe it's not what you would say to, you know, as part of your pitch deck, but really being honest about the development timelines um, and articulating where you have to make a choice or compromise. And this isn't going to be 100% baked, but we can get it, you know, 80% of the way there and then iterate together on that final 20%. Um, so, yeah, really gearing towards more long term relationships. I've seen that capacity and that interest grow over the past couple of years in tandem with the uptake of these kind of the material space and the new innovations. And then lastly, I, I can't stress it enough. Um, I think it was said earlier, but I just want to kind of bold and underline it is getting your suppliers at the table with you, having those conversations, figuring out exactly how it's going to drop into your existing supply chain, or maybe where it's not, and you need to problem solve for that is instrumental. Um, it will become a barrier if it's not handled at the start. And it's also, we expanded into Asia in 2020 to get manufacturing partners on board at the table with our partners because we saw it as such a, a massive unlock that's needed to really actually do some of this stuff, not just test it, but then move it to, to scale. Do you think that all of the challenges in supply chain over the last year or two across industries has also made brands kind of perk up and say, we really got to have a long-term fix for this stuff? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot more conversation around um, near shoring, doing micro production, you know, it, it's just kind of forced or, or pulled closer. A lot of the exploratory things that were going and maybe we're like a, a nice to have, oh, we'll think about to being like, okay, really, like if we needed to implement this in the next X years, how would we go about doing that? Mm -hmm. um, so ab yeah, absolutely. Allison, from your end, obviously, as we've we've iterated it, you are the you you're at the forefront of this stuff, and it's a priority for reformation. But have you heard in the market talking to other brands, and do you see an increase in your peers being interested in this stuff, and and what are they sharing with you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I um, I think it's just becoming understood as the new baseline, right? That that if you're not working on it, you're going to be left behind because this is where the industry is moving and, you know, consumers are increasingly um, concerned, about, maybe concerned is the wrong word, but interested in the sustainability practices of the brands that they shop. Um, in terms of, you know, what, what I'm seeing across kind of you know, our, our, our PR brands, I think it's, what's interesting is the variety of approaches, right? Like some people are very vocal about it, use it like it's a for, at the forefront of their marketing. And then some folks are much quieter about it and keeping it very close to their vest. And, you know, that, that is a brand by, by brand, by brand choice. Um, it's just very interesting to see the variety of approaches to the progress. We're going to pull in more questions. The audience questions are great so far, but I want to mention this one that, that Hannah, Juris Schoen, which I definitely mispronounced your name. Sorry, Hannah, um, brought up. But I think it's an interesting point for Ingvar and Andy in particular, and, and actually all of you. But like you both are doing different things in this market and providing an alternative to tra traditional leather or, or what have you. Um, how do you, do you think that the, Ingvar, let's start with you. Do you think what you all are doing is is the best alternative? And and how do you when a, when a brand comes to you and says we want to try a bunch of different things or we're not exactly sure what method we want to use? How like is is the pitch that you are the best in class and this is the only thing, or do you think that it's a mix of different types of products that brand should be using? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I kind of 
of course, being a young startup, it's a competitive environment. Uh, but then also, uh, but then also, I mean, the amount of leather that gets used in the world. Uh, I mean, the figures that I've seen are somewhere in the range of 28 billion square feet annually. Uh, so I think that, you know, there are going to be multiple solutions to um to to these um to these uh, to the problem um so of course we you know when we are pitching ourselves that we are you know we have this specific way of creating real leathers uh, from from animal cells uh, which is different from what other people are doing whether that's mycelium or natural fiber welding so so really kind of i mean it is about the we don't go kind of around trash talk in the other other companies and what they're doing and it's really up to the brand about you know what are they looking for um and what fits in with their specific goals and and uh, and timelines and and product categories and price points etc so so i mean these the the brands are you know fully capable of making those decisions what they f feel is the best you know best uh, solution for their current problems um and uh, and as i said i don't think that there is going to be one solution that fixes all of the problems. Andy, Andy, what about you? How do you approach this? Yeah, so so when I'm not wearing my marketing hat, I have my BD hat on, and uh, I see so many inquiries coming in from brands like large and small, uh, just wanting material. And so I think there's an, the pie is big enough for all of us in this space to to, to have some. Um, I don't think there's there, there's not a lack of opportunity um, from from brands, and so I, I do think there's going to be multiple technologies that went out. There's going to be even in the same space. There's going to be multiple companies using the same technology. That there, there's there, there's yeah plenty of business, and I think um, yeah if, if we just look at the the environment right now too, and what brands are looking for, what consumers are work uh, looking for. Um, it's uh, you know it's a, it's an urgent need too, and I think um, as we're moving towards uh, fully sustainable materials, there's stepping stones along the way. Like we can't solve the world's problems tomorrow, um, and so I think we look for a lot of the in incumbent technologies too uh, to to help us. And and I you know look back at the at the tannery example too. Um, th there's a lot of like processing involved. There there's a lot of Art, artistry involved over the you know few uh, centuries of, of of development in the tanning industry. Um, so can we take some of that as new material providers and uh, and evolve it and make greener chemistries for our materials that we're putting out? I think um, so. Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll stop there. But yeah, plenty of opportunity, and I think um, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll stop. Brittany, as as someone who has a bit of more of a um, big pick outside in, you're not really outside, but you know what I mean. You're working with everyone. What do you think the competition is like right now? Is it super fierce? Is is it because there's just so many players? Is it hard for brands to discern who to look at and who not? What what's the kind of scene at the moment? So a lot of our work centers around picking a, a specific area and then benchmarking, if you will, or doing a comparative assessment of players that are playing in that area. And we make sure that we never put a, um, a winning crown on someone or a medal on someone. Um, we try to do it as agnostic as possible to say, look, here's where the technology is. Here's the pros and cons. Um, and all of them are different. And for our partners, they're actually all looking for different things um, for different reasons, depending on, you know, what their products are. Um, so I, I would agree with what was said is, you know, the pie is certainly large enough. And I'm sure when everyone's doing their fundraising decks, their total addressable market is massive. Um, so even just getting a slice of that is, uh, you know, incentive enough to keep doing this work. Um, I don't see it as and maybe it's because the apparel industry itself is also competitive, but there seems to be, you know, enough room for everyone at the table that uh, I think innovation echoes the same completely. Allison, what is your sort of strategy? Do you work with a ton of different groups? Do you have your eye on a particular kind of material that you think could be a big unlock? Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of think about it as a portfolio approach, right? So, um, but from two angles. So one angle is uh, timeline, right? So we we have some partnerships that may not, you know, execute for 
X number of years, and then we need an interim solution between now and then. It may not be perfect, but it's the best we can do at this moment. So we kind of think about um, about it from both a timeline, like go to market perspective, and then as well as an application perspective. So we do a lot of product categories, um, but then even like double clicking within something like footwear, we have a range of price points within footwear. So one material may be applicable to one product type, and we actually may have a different material need for a different product type. So um, I think there's room for for multiple partners in the room, not just from the supplier's point of view of having multiple brands, but also from the brand's view of having multiple suppliers. I think that's integral to our approach. Yeah. Um, and Bridget in the audience, Bridget Molnar had a really great question. And we talked about this a bit. Andy and Ingvar, I asked you, um, like the size of the businesses you work with. And Reformation obviously is... I don't know if you still consider your st yourself a startup. You have private equity backing, all that stuff. But you're still, you know, in the early, you're not 50 years old, you're 10 years old or what have you. But um, you have a good amount of sales a, a year, your global business. What Bridget is asking is how do more early stage startup brands best position themselves to work with material innovators? Large material companies don't want to partner with really small brands, she said. And yeah, many of the smaller innovators go after partnerships with really big brands. So it, I guess the question is, if you're a small brand, say you're due, I don't know, I mean, 10 million and less a year in sales, but you, you want to invest in this stuff. Um, how do you get, Andy or Ingvar, how do you get them, uh, how does a brand get you to pay attention to them? And Brittany, maybe you could speak to this too, what your your big picture advice are as vices, but maybe Andy, we could start with you. And and if a really small company comes and says, "I really want to work with you. I really believe in what you're doing." How do you approach that? Yeah. So um, a, a, an easy answer is on our website at forager .bio. Um, We actually have a, a program where we bring in students and designers to work with our materials. And so um, you can, even if you're a small business, I would uh, urge you to apply there. Um, uh, so, so that's one way uh, of working with our materials. And the other that we focused on is uh, our cooperatives, like what I described earlier with, uh, with Reformation and the other fashion for good companies um, is, is kind of getting a core group together that um, have similar uh, performance specs that we're trying to hit and kind of collectively all work towards this goal. And so we're opening up more of those cooperative programs for other material types, other types of applications. Um, so definitely reach out to us. Uh, we have um, uh, another forum for just business development inquiries and we curate these and, uh, and, and we'll be in touch. And while we might not be able to do something with you today, um, certainly there's opportunities in the future as, um, th as things come to market and to scale. Ingvar, how do you approach this? Yeah, I mean, we would, of course, love to be able to solve the problems for everybody that wants to work with us. Um, I think, you know, when we look at brand partnerships, of course, there is the, that well mission alignment and of course kind of the our ability to grow with our partners um that is uh, that is one thing that we look at but um, you know the bandwidth that we have internally because it takes we put a lot of uh, time and effort into the into the partnerships so again kind of just our bandwidth as a startup um while we wish that we could work with multiple partners um we have bandwidth to kind of focus on um kind of only only a few at the time um the you know, as we scale, of course, we want to open that up, and I mean, I do, I do, um, I do suggest that people reach out to us and uh, and kind of let us know what they're working on, because again, you never know. But uh, I think it's uh, also you know, on the question of scale, important to highlight that I mean, even companies like you know, uh, Impossible Foods, when they were launching, they were available. You know, I think they had like 20 burgers available per night in at Jardinier in, uh, in 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 San Francisco. Um, this one restaurant, and you had to go and kind of wait in line and get a number to be able to kind of buy one of their burgers. And of course, now you can go into Whole Foods and and buy it everywhere. So so uh, as kind of as much as we would love to be able to supply the entire industry today, uh, it unfortunately does take time. And uh, and I kind of appreciate everybody's patience while we while we scale. 
Lesson of the day is patience. Um, Brittany, what, what do you suggest? I'm sure you're talking to a lot of these brands who are, help me, help me, I want to do this, but feel stuck. Yeah, I kind of joke, I also get a lot of inbound emails from friends or friends of friends or former colleagues or whatever that are looking to start something and they, you know, are, are curious as to who they should reach out to. Um, you know, you heard it best uh, from these guys. It, it just takes time. Um, it's good to get on the radar and reach out. You never know. Uh, I think going to events where you can meet these um, innovators and see their solutions is always good because then you kind of have that face-to-face -face connection. Um, that's always helpful because this is early stage most of the time. Um, I'll put in the chat, we have an innovator that was in our program a, a few years ago called Common Objective, which is like a tech platform where you can find um, and help with your kind of setting up your supply chain if you're early on. Um, so I'll put that in the chat because that could be a really um, helpful resource for um, some of the smaller brands out there getting started. Great. Um, Allison, what, what do you advise your, your colleagues? I'm sure people just come to you constantly asking for help on this stuff as, as a transitioning from startup to big company, company that's been a leader in the space. What do you suggest to small brands that want to break in and, and work with people? Yeah, this is probably not what you want to hear, <laughs> what small brands want to hear, but um, because small brands are resource constrained, right? But we shouldn't underestimate the resources that it takes on the brand side to do this as well. So the difference between like walking into a showroom and buying a, a, a kind of established generic material, that's one thing starting a partnership and the time and effort that it takes for you to get your product specs right, get your prototypes made, like it is just a more labor intensive process to be working in innovative materials. So my advice to smaller scale companies is don't underestimate either whether it's your time because you're a solopreneur or you have a small team, make sure that there's dedicated resources to working on this because you really won't get traction unless you're spending the right amount of time and effort. Like you can't put all the development on the material supplier. Yeah, so so this is a great segue to a question Lynn Morris asked, which is what is the range of investment a brand would need to invest to create a partnership in the current life cycle of new materials? So essentially, like how much money a year do you need to spend to make this happen? I'm sure it's different for every brand and every partnership, but I'm throwing this out to all of you. What can you give us some sort of structure in terms of like, how, what percentage of a budget are you going to need to use? What, how much money is this going to cost someone? Brittany, maybe I, mean, I can start with you. I was going to say, I can anchor it at the very, very high end, maybe. I mean, we can look at what yeah. Inditex just announced with Infinitive Fiber Company. I mean, they signed a $100 million offtake deal. So that's to take a, you know, a sizable chunk of what the Infinitive Fiber Company is producing. And I think it's $100 million over three years. And that's Inditex. So maybe we, we put that as like the big um, you know, tanker. And then there's you know variations all the way down to a sailboat as far as agility of agreements and, and financial contributions. So a hundred million dollars of of product is not of material is not that much for them. But if you're no. a brand that generates like I don't know forty million dollars a year in sales, how much of your budget is going to materials? That's what we'd need to figure out. And then what percentage? I guess what percentage of your your development? You also have to have a development line on your your budget which is i don't know if a lot of brands have that but in your sampling or research and development that would this is that's where this money would come from correct yeah and the capacity of how how much bandwidth you have to work with how many different um, providers so you know this 100 million may be a drop in the bucket to inditex but it is a huge huge um, thing for infinite fiber company right like as an innovator so it depends on, yeah. and like we said, building those long-term relationships is resource intensive on both sides. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'll kind of open it up to you guys because I think you'll have more insights there. I think, and you know, Alison pointed out the, you know, the, the, the important thing is that, I mean, it's you know, the financial commitment from the companies is, is one thing. And of course that can vary from, from, from small to large. And I think that's you know, depending just on, on what company uh, the the innovative you know, the material companies work with, but it's really the time and the effort and the kind of the team that and often it's a dedicated team that is working on this because again, kind of implementing an innovative material into a 
product line and then launching it and of course then the communication around it and everything i mean that's a significant um time and effort uh, from the from the brands themselves that are that have to be put in place so so yeah i mean it's it's more than just a dollar amount committed i can imagine you know, i don't know how much the inditex deal would be worth if you calculated the time and effort internally that they would be putting towards that but i'm sure that it would be significantly more than just 100 million so uh, so yeah that's something to take into account we have some programs that uh, we, we can get you in for the price of a Kia Sorento. Um, uh, it, it depends on like- who, Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, right? Uh, like if, if we're aligned with what the vision is for uh, that brand or that uh, that designer um, and how it fits into our overall like near-term objectives. So uh, we're quite flexible. Um, uh, and again, the more we can do sort of a consortium style uh, partnerships uh, where everyone sort of shares uh, the cost and the risks um, it makes it helpful and makes it more affordable to, to get started. And of course, uh, as we develop materials within those programs, then there are the offtake agreements that come later. But just to get started and get innovating, um, we are pretty nimble and can do things um, on, on a lower cost scale. Got it. So one, I think we have a couple more audience questions that are a little bit um, more granular, but I think, um, oh, you, Tiffany, Tiffany Wa has two different questions that I thought were both really good. And this one is for specifically to you, Allison. And, and she asked, um, is there a certain stage of technology development that reformation targets where is the point of being too early stage and how do startups engage without formal partnerships that's a bunch of questions but i think the main one is like where in the process do you start um that that you want to be involved with these partners like how far along do they have to be for you to say okay let's try to do take a risk with them yeah as I mentioned earlier, like with this portfolio approach, where like we try, we we are open to a variety of stages. What I will say is like our starting point is is like at least one physical proof of concept, right? Like if someone comes in and is like, I'm gonna make a material out of I don't know, um, you name it, like, and it's just an idea. Um, it, it there's nothing really for us to re respond to. So what's really important for us is some really clear understanding of like. What is the actual viability of what we're talking? Even if we don't know how we're going to get there, what is it going to? What's the what's the idea? And can you provide us just a little scrap of what it would look like, just so we have something concrete to look up, to look all together? Yeah, Andy and Ingvar, how transparent do you get with your partners or potential partners when you're having these conversations? Like, do you? Because I, I assume you don't want to overpromise and under deliver, or maybe you do, I don't know. Everybody has a different approach to that, but this stuff is gonna take a really long time. And how much are you, you know, communicating that and reinforcing that as you start to develop a relationship with a brand? Um, I, I can kick that off, very transparent. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, I mean, that's the only way you can build that trust. Um, because again, again, we are not looking at, we're not looking at a seasonal, like one season partnership. We're looking to build a long-term, uh, long-term collaboration uh, and, and partnership. So, so that transparency is, is key. And of course, I mean, we, you know, the, the, the partnership that we announced on the, on the technical development of our heights is, we send them hides and they they you know they work uh, on the tanning and the finishing. So again, they see everything that is coming out of our labs. Um, and uh, so again, you know, they see the progress that we're making. They see um, they see all the all the things that we need to improve on, and they communicate them back. So so it's really it has to be a very honest uh, relationship back and forth because otherwise you know otherwise well it will fall apart before we know it. So. Uh, so yes, honesty is key when it comes to partnerships. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And um, so our company turns 15 next week. Um, we haven't worked in the fashion industry for 15 years, but other industries. And so uh, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way, uh, but we've also made a lot of progress along the way. And so I think what we've learned in other industries and taking those materials to scale um, is applicable for what we're doing now in the fashion space. And of course, there's like new twists and turns, but um, we can look back to a lot of the expertise and 
the foundation that we've built to, um, you know, to help partners get to scale quickly. I think uh, with us too, um, we sort of do our projects in three stages. Um, the first is sort of like a discovery phase where we're doing high throughput screening of materials for brands to just test and say, does this even meet your performance characteristics that you're looking for? If it does, we go then to um, like a, a, a lab scale where uh, our partners can actually make products out of the mycelium that we've grown and test them on a prototype stage. And then if all of those uh, boxes get checked, then we can go to pilot scale, even up to commercial scale. Um, so there are checks and balances along the, way, along the way in our process to make sure that we're doing what we say we can do and that the material is actually um, you know, performing the way the customer wants. And then the last point on that too, of just like getting to scale, while we are building some of our own farms, we've also are able to leverage existing mushroom farm in infrastructure, which there's 3 billion pounds of installed mushroom farm capacity around the world. Um, and so we're able to retrofit those farms uh, instead of growing mushrooms, they can actually grow our air mycelium process. So um, it, we're working on that in the food space now, but talking about like getting to scale quickly so we can meet those expectations of brands and consumers. Um, that's one of the ways that we're, we're going about this. And Tiffany had another question that I thought was a good way to end this. How do you make these connections? She meant, she said, what are the best types of forms or matchmaking for these partnerships? She obviously conferences like this, you get to meet people. Um, Ingvar, I know you said email us, that sort of thing, but maybe we start with Brittany and then I'm curious to know from all of you, like what are the best ways to connect and, and find the right partner? Because there's clearly so many people on both sides and matchmaking, I'm sure it can be challenging. Brittany, do you have any kind of big picture advice for someone who's starting from scratch in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's... Uh, an innovation or a startup or a company that you're really interested in, it's good to just start following them because oftentimes they'll post where they're going to be, you know, where will they physically be? I'm not telling you to go out and be a stalker, but, you know, if you can meet someone in person or at an event, you know, you tend to forge a bit more of a relationship than over um, just an email. Um, emails never hurt. Um, I think there are different conferences that happen in different parts of the world. The sustainable angle is coming to mind to me in London, where you can really kind of touch some of these these solutions. Um, Nina and team has been working um, extensively on that for quite a while. Um, there, there's a whole host of other ones. Um, I think we also actually have a newsletter that we send out that shares all the ones that we're aware of. So you can always sign up for that. Um, information by osmosis, I suppose. Um, and then, yeah, you know, don't ever hesitate to reach out. Don't wait. Uh, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen is your email goes unresponded to. So, yeah. Allison, do you have any tips? Yeah, I think it's, you know, take a lot of conversations, right? Like it's, it's, it's kind of like dating, like you're going to meet a lot of people um, before you find the right partnership. And so don't get discouraged if you have three conversations and none of them work out. It really does. It's, it, it will take a while to find the right one for you. Um, and so just understand that, it, that networking is part of it, right? And just, and, and it also, it's a relatively small in industry and people are very open to like introducing you to someone else. Like, it, it, oh, this is, might not be right for you, but these folks are a little bit further along. Like, I think we're all relatively aware of, of the landscape here. And if you need help, you know, ask for it and, and ask, for, ask for alternative introduction. I think people are fairly open in making those. Amazing. Ingvar and Andy, do you do either of you have any tips about or how, how do you like to get connected with people? Uh, I'll just echo one of the comments here is Material Innovation Initiative uh, is a great resource as well as uh, Fashion for Good. And I think both of these organizations do a great job of liaisoning between brands and, and early stage um, uh, innovators. Uh, also, again, just reach out, send an email. Um, uh, a lot of times we'll, uh, our CEO will respond to you. So um, that's, uh, and then of course, like find us at conferences, come and talk to us. Um, ha happy to, happy to inter interface. Similar. Yes. I mean, absolutely. Reach out to us. Hello at reachalabsync.com. Um, and, uh, and it's also conferences like these and, uh, 
often it helps to get a really good understanding of what you're looking for before you go and reach out to people. Um, so whether you're a brand that is looking to work with an innovative materials company or an innovative materials company that is looking to work with a brand um, to kind of, yeah, to have a really deep think about what, what it is that you're looking at, looking for the, uh, looking uh, to get out of the partnership. Um, what is, what is the product that you're creating, uh, whether that is from a brand or a materials company perspective, and, uh, and who really would be the customer for that. Um, and that can really help you inform you know, which type of, type of company, which stage of company that you're reaching out to as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great industry to be a part of and, uh, and so excited to see that it's growing as it is. Super interesting to see it all come to fruition after all these years, really excited to see this stuff come to market in you know, the next, next few years or so. Thank you all for, for joining me. This was great. Yes, Thank you. Hi, everybody. And, and congratulations to all of you too on your recent partnership announcements. Um, it's, I think that's proof, right, that the industry is growing. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, so now we're going to have to take another 30 second break for our on demand viewers. And we'll be back with our next panel in just a few moments.